systems don't have a generation which immediately comes out from the next generation. For example, in insects, after laying the eggs, it goes through, uh, the eggs are hatched into larvae, larvae um, go into, develop into pupa, then pupa open up and the adults come out and those adults then give rise to eggs. So how do you go about doing that? This single, these single variable, uh, single parameter models, it's very difficult to think that they would consider all these different life stages into one parameter. So we did some work, actually Shumit did, but uh, I will just give you a feeling about how, how one goes about doing. These are, uh, th this is the kind of work which you do if you are doing a research work or something like that. You want to write a paper and things like that. So that you should get some idea how things go. Okay, so this is the life cycle of Drosophila which starts, this is the adult, and a, a mature adult uh, within a day gives, uh, lays eggs. These eggs then takes about one, two, three days and goes through different levels of in stars, if you know, if you remember a little bit of, uh, goes through different stages, make larvae, and those larvae then, these larvae can move actually and then they go through different in stars of that. Then they form pupa, they form a covering around them, and that becomes a, a, a non-movable, a completely non-interacting uh, structure. And after three or four days, the structure breaks and the adult comes out. That is the pre-adult, a kind of very early adult, that then it feeds and grows and is ready to lay eggs. This is its life cycle. It's about, in 25 degrees, it's about 11 to, um, 12 days it takes, and higher temperature takes, uh, lower temperature takes longer. Now there are only two stages when this uh, animal, uh, when this uh, insect eats, when it's adult and when it's larvae. Okay? So eating means what? It's feeding on uh, resources and it's growing in size. In this case, once the eggs are hatched, there's no growing in size, uh, sorry, there's no growing in number. The number of larvae to start with should be the number of eggs. There's no other growth in numbers, but the growth in size is important because that decides how good an adult it will be. If it's a very uh, low-fed larvae, then the adult will be very weak and it won't lay proper eggs and all that. So it makes a lot of difference of feeding in this. So larvae and adult are the, have the two feeding stages and it takes about one day for the, this to be fertile. Rest of this is immo immobile. Okay. So this is how the life cycle goes. Now you want to see how to put this thing in a model. Okay. So obviously each lifestyle, each life stage is different. It is different morphologically, physiologically. This one and this one is very different physiologically. Behaviorally, they are all different. Okay. So there has to be some. Uh, understanding about how these stages interact among themselves and whatever be, let's say you started with 100 eggs. Do you get 100 adults? No. Okay, so what decides whether the number will stay the same or it will reduce or whatever. So the final number of adults in each generation will depend on the highly nonlinear processes that governs the passage through this life, uh, through the life stages. So we can only model, we can't really be uh, 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 larvae and see what goes on. So what we need to, uh, what we are trying to look at is predicting dynamics of populations over time. So my model is something where I can, uh, I should be able to plot number of adults at every generation. But I have to integrate my understanding about reproduction, growth, mortality at the individual level and the density depend, dependent regulation at the population level, okay, which means the competition. So both these things have to go into the model. So this is one of the kind of modeling which is done now, I mean today's day. Here is the model that you can think of, this is one of the models you can think of. Here is your larvae and this is the next generation that adults have laid eggs. So there are two re, uh, uh, stages where they eat, the larvae and the adult. Now larvae to become adult, pupa we are not even considering because it's completely inert stage, nothing happens to it. So the larvae has to be viable, has to live to become an adult. So that's important. So it has to eat, it has to have enough space because all these experiments are done in test tubes. Okay. Now these, this adult 
should be able to lay eggs. So that's known as fecundity. Okay? So it should be able to lay eggs. Now there are several feedback loops that are, or density dependent loops that it works. The number of larvae, if it's large, then it gets less food, so it's less numbers are viable. Okay? So there's a dependence here. If the number of adults are too many, then there is a space uh, problem and if, they, if the, the density of adults are too much, then they don't lay egg very well. Okay? So it has an effect on fecundity. And if the larvae doesn't get enough food or doesn't get enough space, then the adult that it gives, it doesn't lay uh, 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 very many eggs. Okay? So there's a loop here. So how many eggs will come in the next generation starting from the number of eggs that were laid in the earlier generation? You have to consider all these three loops. Now how do you consider these three loops? I have no clue what to do. What do we do? We go into, so here are the, um, uh, whatever I said, that um, how larval stages affect and how the adult stage affects. So there are two loops, loops A and uh, C, A and C is how larvae affects um, larvae to adult transition and adult to next uh, egg laying transition. And that is loop C. A and B involve larvae, loop C involve adult. Okay? So they all depend on the size, uh, the, the number of the larvae, the size of the adult, the density of the adult, and the nutrition that the adult gets. This is all we can think of. With all this is thought of, nothing else. Okay, but then what do we do? We go and try to figure out how do I, how do I put these into mathematical expressions? That is what a model is, after all. You have by word you have certain processes and you want to convert it into mathematics. Then only you can. That is your first model. Unfortunately, what happens is most applied mathematics people work on somebody else's model. They never develop their own model. So what they do is they take a model, then they change a functional form, and then they work on it. But developing your own model is very difficult, because these are the kind of things you have to go through. You don't even know what to do. Nobody has written a model on this. So this is where you have to learn how to model. And I think it's not difficult. It's just a matter of your attitude. You just, you have to talk to the biologist, ecologist, you have to figure out how, how to put a process into a functional form and then you'll be able to do it. Nothing special about it. So here are the density dependent roots. I'm coming from very descriptive text to step by step into more, uh, a form where I can write a mathematical function. So larval density dependent pre-adult mortality, which means if the density of larva is too much, then the viability goes down so that the, the larvae die. So pre-adult mortality means there is, the larvae are dying. Larval density dependent adult fecundity. If the density is too much here, then the adults that result from those larvae don't lay enough eggs. Larval density dependent female size. So less food, Females are the ones which will lay egg. They are going to be thin. They won't be able to lay eggs. And then their uh, uh, female size and female fecundity. Then you have to go and look at the literature in the uh, uh, in in this area to figure out have people done uh, done any experiments that I can get some idea about these functional forms. So we need to consider these interactions, and you go to the all these different insects, so I'm, this is an insect model, so I will go and look at insect papers in ecology journals and try to figure out what do they have. So here is, uh, which requires a fair amount of literature survey, and if you are working in ecology models, you might as well look at ecology papers, because that gives you a lot. First of all, ecology people are constantly giving you newer and newer type of uh, ways of looking at things. They do their experiments. so. Let's look at this. Out of a lot, of, there was not a single paper which gave all these things. So we looked at at, at least um, uh, at the, what I'm going to show you are from five or six papers, but obviously you have to find them out. So here is one, egg density dependent larval survivorship. So what is the experiment that people have done? What they have done is not what I want, but something close to what I want. This was done in 85. X axis is the number of eggs. So these are one-time experiments 
one generation experiments. In one tube you take two eggs, another tube you take four eggs, another tube you take eight eggs like that, you actually more than that. So, and you grow those with the same amount of food and see how many adults come out. That was the experiment. They did that and they get, got the, the, the dotted ones are the experimental data. And they got data like this. And all they did was they did a fit of the initial part of the um, data. That is when the egg sizes are less, then there, there's an initial increase. And in that paper, they only talked about that there is a hump-like phenomena, okay? Uh, if you increase the crowd, then the number of adults that come out are less. That's all they did in that paper. It's a very uh, a long paper and has lots of data other than this. We took that, we looked at this, and this is the expression for the fit here, okay? So you can see that they are fitting this entire thing with the exponential function. So this is, what are the parameters? This is the number of adults. This is, small n is the number of eggs. Maximum survival of larvae in absence of crowd is capital C. So when there is very, very few eggs, then there's a linear increase. You can see that, the first term in the exponential series. And the small c is the sensitivity parameter of survival to larval crowding. So every species has different sensitivity, like everything else. Every species has certain qualities to survive stress, to survive, respond to stress and all that. So this is what they, they did. So they gave this particular uh, functional form for this. So this was one which we took. There was another egg density dependent adult fecundity. So this is larval survivorship and this is fecundity. Both are dependent on egg, which is in our model, we are considering that egg to larva transition is completely straightforward, nothing else. 100 egg means 100 larva. Okay, so the experiments are done with egg because doing experiments with larvae are almost beyond, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult because they are wide, they, they, they pour inside the agar that on which they are grown, you can't count them, you want to hold them, they get mashed up and it's a mess. So start with uh, uh, egg, they're much more sturdy and you put two eggs, 20 eggs and things like that and count how many adults are flying out, that's it. Easy experiment in that sense. This was another paper where they looked at how is the fecundity of the adult, the, the reproductive ability of the adult female, Rosophila, is dependent on how many eggs you start with in that population. And you can see as the number of eggs increased, the fecundity, ability to uh, lay eggs by the female have gone down. You can see that this, these are experimental data points, okay? So fit that into this. So this is the functional form. There is a maximum fecundity, which is species specific, which you can have when there's no crowd. And then there's a sensitivity, sensitivity of fecundity to larval crowd, okay? So that is the one which is reducing it from the maximum. Therefore, there's an exponential function, okay? So this is another piece of data that we looked at. The third piece of data that we looked at was another paper. You can see that adult density dependent on, uh, dependence on uh, adult fecundity. So here the experiment is that in x-axis, number of adults kept in tubes and how many of eggs they laid. Okay, Female fecundity, eggs per female per day, y-axis. And this is number of adults kept, females kept. So you can see, forget about, um, um, there are these two types of food. Let's forget about that. So here again, you see that here is the fecundity parameter, which I showed in the earlier slide. And this is the functional form, which is something like this. Okay? The sensitivity parameter of female fecundity to adult crowd. You can see the functional form is different because it has been fitted to this. And uh, there's so much variability, but this is how the experiments are. So you take the experimental data, this is their paper, they fit this experimental data onto some functional form, and that's what we took it as. And the last one was, how does egg density 
uh, regulate mean weight. As I said, the, if the number of larvae are too many, then food is less by each of the larvae. Then the adult that comes out of those larvae are thinner or thicker uh, or, or sick or whatever it is. So then mean weight will go down. So this experiment, again another paper, kept min different numbers of eggs, 200, 600, uh, 900 and all that. And they counted the size of the adults that came out of it, okay, female sizes the mean weight of that and this is the kind of data points they got and they fitted it to exponential function where this is the maximum when there is no crowd this is the maximum mean weight of the adult which is species specific when there is no crowd and this is the sensitivity parameter which reduces the weight of the adult when there is too much crowd by giving reduced uh, due to reduced food etc. Now so here are the four functional forms that we got. This is what we have, and this is what we can use. These, this is what we consider as major density dependent functions using different life history traits. Now, I want to write an equation. I want to write a model for, out of all these. So I don't, I, the model can't be a four separate equation. So obviously what you do have to do is you have to um, reduce this into uh, least number of equations that you can, which means you have to, egg is something, egg number is something which cannot be counted. This, so I have to get egg number out of it. Little bit of algebra, not too much algebra. Little bit of algebra can, uh, it requires, it doesn't require more than that. And the equation that you get, no mathematician likes it because it's so complicated, but that is how life is. So here is the equation, okay? Now you may not like it, because you are, we are used to seeing discrete models and nice um, uh, logistic maps. But this is what it is. Every time you introduce a little bit of detail, this is how the complexity goes up in the model. Now, uh, complexity of model itself is a subject to discuss. But at least in terms of numbers of parameters, the number of parameters have gone up tremendously. Each one will have one capital and one small letter. So. Number of parameters have gone up, the functional forms have become e to the power, e to the power, and very, very complex. Now, if you have a computer, that's not a problem, but you can see that it's possible to do, under certain condition, it's possible to do some amount of analysis. Under some condition, putting one or two parameters equal to zero, you can do analysis. And some of you who think that you know mathematics better than others, you should try and see that you, if you start with a very complicated model, how do you go about doing stability analysis? What is the steady states? Let's find that out first. Okay. So here what we have done is, now we have only two equations, though they are coupled, like this equation has W and W equation has N, okay? So they are coupled, it's a discrete equation because this, this is an insect, um, non-overlapping generation. So these are two couple discrete equations. So if you, if you are looking for complex models, look at this. It's discrete model, but at the same time it's coupled uh, discrete equations. And these two variables are adult population number and adult population mean weight. Okay. And why did we get rid of eggs? Because we in the lab or in the field you can't really cal uh, count eggs. So both of these are measurable in the lab and in the field. So if you're trying to model something which you are going to do in the lab, or you somebody has done it in the lab and you want to make a model, you have to go through it. There is a directed search in the literature, and then there is some amount of abstractness that has to go in in terms of functional forms and your understanding about what can be measured, what cannot be measured in the laboratory. Now, one can take this, put it in a computer, just simply, um, uh, you can make, you can, I can give you numbers for different parameters because all these functional forms that we took from the other papers, they, when they did those fitting of those curves, they had given numbers. You can put those numbers and take any of these parameters as bifurcation parameter and figure out whether it is stable, unstable, chaotic and all that. So all these things can be done. I'm not showing you because you can't uh, continue to do that. There's some uh, data that I want to show you is something like this. 
these are experimental data these two I just showed you these are more experimental data and you can see what uh, this the same model uh, whether they can be used for different kind of food regimes or not I don't know but this is the uh, these are experimental data for different food regimes now which are the parameters that need to be changed to fit to the model that I showed you this was fit to the rigor model now I think that this was not right I think one should consider a larger model where all the life history traits are considered. Now I need to find out what are the parameters I should use to fit these, not the recur but this complicated model or what are the parameters I need to choose to fit this kind of data. This is the kind of work that is done even I mean, these are recent work I mean this is the kind of things that people, uh, people have been doing people are still doing it hasn't been very easy but still there is something which you can look forward to, to ecological modeling where both data and models have to be models which are more realistic than simple one variable one parameter recur models can be used okay um, I'm, I don't want to speak anything more about uh, single population models uh, anymore let me just tell you a little bit about ecological interactions because in reality no species lives alone in one place so they are always living with others now here are some again data as you can see that um, I generally uh, put everything initially the uh, the experimental data and then try and see how modeling can be uh, done so that these data can be explained so I, I showed these two to you uh, to you earlier this and I mentioned that these are here there are two uh, data sets plotted together and they are because we are plotting two different uh, species okay so in this case also we are plotting only the prey but there is one more now ecological interactions as has been given here and many of you know they can interact in very different ways there can be competition, there can be parasitism, predation, mutualistic um, uh, relationship, commensalism, a lot of these different, um, these are different chapters in, in ecology books. But when a, a community, in, a biological community is one where all these different species which are interacting with each other in different ways live together, that is what is known as a biological community and the structure of the ecological interaction is known as community structure. Uh, I have a plot here which talks about the dynamics of 2001 uh, foot and mouth epidemic in, in UK. Why did I bring it here? For the simple reason that we have kept ecology and epidemiology together. Actually they are not different because even in, in epidemiology what do you do? You study the population of disease causing agents so you will use similar models so if you learn ecology it's not impossible to work in epidemiology of course you have to know what you're modeling how do they interact etc so I put this uh, to show that there is a, this is a, a, a plot when the disease was this was in in this this is also called mad cow disease I think and this was always seen in farms in UK these all these dots are farm the red dots are the farms which are infected by the uh, the cows are infected by the disease and the black ones which are not infected now th this is from a paper which has a model in it so it's very interesting to see how a modeling can describe the the dis the the um, this um, what is it called the how the disease has diffused all over it started in one or two places and then it went on to all these different farms because some of these farms exchange cows among themselves and that's how the disease moves from one to but this kind of clustered thing that the the modeling uh, people who were doing the modeling for this they were very interested in finding out what is happening they wanted to know what is the connectivity pattern among these um, uh, farms and all that so basically they are looking at population size change with time and space whether it's a disease causing um, uh, organism or whether it's some kind of ecological interacting organism here also there it's interaction because there is a virus and there is a host and here these are predators and prey so the, the 
the, bio, uh, the ecology is very similar, therefore the models are also very similar. The, I just mentioned the kind of ecological interactions you can talk about. They are all different kinds, but let me, uh, let me just simply go into a picture which will give you easier um, way to figure out. So this is a case where there are two species, okay? The, 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 these species are given in, in these ovals, species one and species two. The arrows represent how one is interacting with the other, this one to this and that one to that. The sign represents the effect of one species on the other, okay? So in this case, species two is being positively, you know, gaining from the presence of species one and whereas species one is being negatively affected by species two. Okay. I can ask you what do you think this interaction is, but let me explain the others. In this case, both of them are affecting each other. This is zero. I think, no, this is uh, minus minus, this is plus plus. Both of them are helping each other. Both of them are affecting negatively each other. This one, one is helping, the other one has no effect. This one, one is uh, having negative effect, the other one has no effect. Okay. So there are names for these. It's easy to remember like that, but there are names for these. As I mentioned this one, that one of them is predating on the other. Species two is eating species one, therefore gaining. So therefore it's a plus. But this one is now, because of the presence of species two, the number of it is going down. So they are uh, uh, being affected negatively. So that's why it's kind of a plus minus interaction. And this is what the names that are given to us. In competition, both of them have negative effect on the each other. In mutualistic um, or symbiosis as it's called, both of them help each other and these two are the other two. Now, this is very common. How do we model these? Okay. Uh, let me not, since I'm trying to uh, reduce. So here is a, a, a celebrated data set, a very old data set. People worked on it, still working on it. and. Um, uh, but it's very interesting that in the in the times in those olden days, this data set was developed by a company which was which used to collect the skin of these animals because they used to make coats fur coats out of them. Now they don't. So they worked on this region of Canada, the very cold region of Canada, the Arctic region, and they the way they collected this data is very interesting. They they. Uh, they, they visualized that this, the winter or summer, they get the number of furs they can hunt. That would represent the abundance of the population. If they can hunt more animals and get more furs, which means that particular winter there were more of those animals. If they get less, which means there are less of those. Okay. So it's an indirect data set, but still it's much better than. Now this one, this is the prey, this is the predator. This prey actually is very interesting because it changes color. In winter it becomes white because that's the time when it eats. It's eaten up by this. So you can see the, that's another very interesting uh, ecological phenomena like adaptation to uh, changes in coat color. So here is the, in, in summer and here it's the same species of animal in winter. Okay? It's a way to hide in the snow. There's so many interesting things in uh, biology that uh, so this is the data set. These are data sets in 1845 to 1935. This is the red one is the predator number of pelts received in thousands. My God, the number they killed. So number of pelts, pelts are the skins um, in thousands. The red one is for this uh, predator and the blue one is for the hair. Okay, this is the lynx, this is the hair. And you can see that the data shows in all possible ways that you can think of uh, experimental data as oscillatory. Okay? So it's periodically, it's going up and down. And between the two, there is some kind, if you look at it, there is some kind of phase difference. You can see that once this goes up, which means the population, when the population of this goes up, obviously it goes and eats up more of this. but. Uh, if, if it's there, if it's not there, if the population of 
when this is high and the population is low, it doesn't get more food, so it starts coming down. When it starts coming down, the, it, it, it experiences less predation pressure, so the number of these go up. So there's a phase difference between the two. This is one of the things that you have to show in your model that it also does that, okay? other than showing that it oscillates. Okay? So which is the model that one looked at? Of course, well-known model by Lotka and Volterra. It's the simplest model for predator-prey interaction. It was developed in 1925-26 by the same uh, by two people, and what they did was they wrote a very simple equation. Everyone, it's always good to start with simple equations and then go into complex. Here is the simple equation: H is the density of prey, P is the density of predators. Okay, and R is the prey population increase, the intrinsic rate, growth rate. A is the predation rate, that how many, when prey and predator interact, when the prey, predator finds a prey, that the, that interaction rate is given by, predation rate is given by A, and B is reproduction rate of predators per prey eaten. So if it eats one prey, the amount of number of predators it will produce, if it eats five preys or ten preys, the number of, it will, it is not the same. Okay, so that rate is given by this, and predators die, so there is a death rate for uh, the predators. The prey is grows, you can see this is completely unlimited growth, there is no uh, density dependence term. If there are no predators, if P is zero, this term is zero, this is zero. So dh dt is r into h, which means exponential increase. When P is there, the number goes down because some of them are eaten up. Okay. Here, when there is no H, there is no, this predator only eats this prey, prey, so if there is no H, it doesn't get any food, so it just dies. It's a very simple model. You can make it more and more complicated by introducing, instead of AHP, you can introduce different types of functional forms of predation. It may not be just simple laws of mass action, it could be any kind of hyperbolic term. You can have different, all sorts of variations you can introduce. But this is the simplest form. What does it do? So obviously, how do you know what does it do? What should you do to find out what is the dynamics of this uh, model? Now I'm not going to take silence. First, what do I find out? Fixed points. Is, does everybody agree that we need to find out the fixed points first? Okay. So can you find out the fixed point for this? It's very simple. And tell what is nice about the fixed point. So how do you find out the fixed point? What do you do to this? What do you do to the left-hand side or right-hand side? So left-hand side, you put it equal to zero because steady state means no change. So the dh, dt, dp, dt will be zero at a particular steady state, h star and p star. And you have to find out h star and p star, okay? Of course, one of them is zero. Don't forget zero, zero. It has completely different stability also. Okay, can't take that long. Did you get these two? Okay, now tell me. So here is H star and P star, and you have got the form of H star is M by B and P star is R by A. Does it, um, does it make you in, interested in looking at these two expressions? For example, if I ask you a question, which I always ask the students, that I increase the growth rate of Prey, H growth rate is increased to from R to 2R. How will the prey growth uh, fixed, uh, how will the steady state of prey be affected? Is it going to be affected? So you see, it's not, it's interesting to see that in this kind of interaction, even if you increase the growth rate of the prey, the prey steady state is not affected. In fact, prey steady state is affected by the predator parameters, and predator steady state is affected by the prey parameter. 
And I always find these things interesting, how beautifully math brings out these small things. Simple math, but it, how nicely it brought out. That if you think that you are going to put a prey which increases faster, this is going to change. It doesn't change because your math has told you that the steady state, steady states don't change. Now, after this, what do we do? After this, we have to find out the stability of the steady states. We would find out the stability of this steady state. These are called interior steady state because both H star and P star are both there. They are both greater than zero. This is zero. We are not interested in that unless you do some other thing. So what do we do? Tell me what do we do? We take the steady states and now to find out the dynamics around the steady state, what do we do? What is the standard procedure? Tell me. Find that, okay. So the way, it, uh, so the simple answer is to find the local stability, we do a linear stability analysis around that. That's all. You add a little bit of perturbation and see whether the perturbation grows or goes down. Okay, so you can do that and you will find that it's basically you take the Jacobian, I mean, I'm just assuming that you all know what Jacobians are. And then you find out the Jacobian, you find things like this. For steady state one, you don't need that. But for steady state two, you find, I don't know if you can see that, because I just simply copied it. There are two eigenvalues. One of them is, um, one of them is uh, the one which we are, the two eigenvalues, one of them is a saddle node. Now, I don't know whether you, this bifurcation, is uh, analysis of these were done or not. Maybe we should have done it. Um, the other one is, this is the other uh, steady state. The, uh, this is a saddle. The, the first one is a saddle. The second one is a center. Okay. Now, the, the, if you look at some of these books on mathematical biology, you would see that there are chapters on uh, stability analysis of single population, single uh, single model, single variable models, chapters on couple models like this. Here, H and P are coupled to each other. So there's nothing but, you know, two equations that are coupled uh, equations. So how to go about it and find out and what are the kind of steady states you get. There are four or five, six types of steady states you can get. And those are named like that. I think in the first day something was done, but I'm not sure. You can have saddle node type of steady state, you can have a center type of steady state, you can have focus, you can have limit cycles, you can have different types of uh, uh, steady states. Uh, if you do a phase plane analysis, it's called phase plane analysis, if you want to look at it in the phase plane. What is, how do the, uh, how, what is the nature of attraction of, uh, of each of these steady states in the surrounding phase plane? Now, this is the one we are interested in because this is against this interior steady state and it is a center. Now, there are properties of center. I don't want to say that except that I want to show you that what do you get. Here is if you, saw, if you simulate this elotka volter equation, this is the kind of plots you get, okay. Same parameters, all I've done is initial density of prey. So as you saw in the single population that M0, Mn is equal to A to the power N into M0 or in the um, continuous logistic model you saw there's an exponential um, solution. In this case also you have a solution and for that solution would depend on the initial, um, uh, initial values of P and H. If there is no Prey, then the host, uh, 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 if there is no predator, the prey grows indefinitely because that is how our equation is. If there are predators, then the prey uh, growth is modulated and this is the kind of solution it gives you. This is a, uh, uh, for the steady state where H star and P star are non-zero. And you see that depending on the initial condition, so these two are same graphs, all the parameters are the same, only the initial value of P is smaller here, larger here, okay. Now, uh, this is a special type of periodic orbit, which are called 
um, it's, it's neutrally stable or uh, or uh, there's another name for it um, neutrally uh, neutral attractors neutrally stable neutral stability essentially means that you get periodic attractors that is what your solution should uh, should also tell you your eigenvalues would tell you but each the the time period and frequency of the oscillation depends on the i'm not sure of the frequency um, the amplitude of the oscillation would depend on the initial values now this is in contrast to what you have heard till now in the whole of first week on limit cycle which means that if you have a, uh, an orbit a periodic orbit and you start from any initial value here what i'm finding is let's say here is p here is h okay so here is my fixed point that the fixed point that is has both h and p non zero okay not the zero zero one i start with some initial value of h and p what i get is a orbit like that i start with some other value of h and p i get an orbit like this okay this is it is uh, um, uh, remember the contrast of the kind of periodic orbit you have seen till now where if this is the initial value let's say there's uh, some x and y like h and p and th this um, uh, fixed point is unstable and it shows periodic um at uh, periodic um, dynamics so you start from some x and y it goes and then it stays goes and lands onto a attractor and continues to go round and round like this you start somewhere here it will come back and do like this this case on that case you saw the time series in this case the time series would be something like this like let's say this one and that one you start somewhere much higher basically whatever initial value you start with you land up on the same attractor same closed periodic orbit with the same amplitude in this case it in that particular case in the load curve alter case the attractor's amplitude depends on the initial value and that's why each of the attractor is different so it's that's why it's called neutrally stable because it, it doesn't get attracted to one particular it doesn't get limited to one particular cyclic orbit or periodic orbit and these are known as limit cycles those are no, known as uh, uh, structurally that's known as structurally stable oscillation these are known as structurally unstable oscillation you put up give a small perturbation it it goes periodically but with a different amplitude so this is quite um, uh, this was interesting to see uh, mathematics is very nice you should uh, it's so nice to see that mathematically you can find out these differences but then this doesn't seem to be very very um, kind of practical so obviously people wanted to know that uh, wh where is the problem it doesn't simple things that come onto your mind is you know it's very simple it does not consider any competition among the prey that is intra specific competition it's considering inter specific prey and predator are competing but not within the prey which means it's not considering density dependence it was considering directly dhdt is r into h actually there should be a density dependent term so it did not consider that there is no saturation that is another thing the the minus term which we had considered in the in the population in the model here so first of all this is something which is very unrealistic we have to change this into a density dependent growth of the prey this death of the predator also looks like to be a simple first order uh, uh, death rate but this also can be some kind of a functional change this is what generally people do they take a model they change these and then see what is the effect and this also we can use different types of 
uh, functional forms to represent this. So that is what people did and went through the same thing of finding out the steady states and uh, this probably I would ask you to do in the afternoon. Uh, find out the steady states when the growth rate is something like this. It's not just R into H, but R into H into K minus H by K, which means you can write it R into H into 1 minus H also. Uh, the basically the logistic growth and uh, just with this alone, you can find out the steady states. You can do the simulation and find out how does it change dynamics. Does it change the dynamics or does it, does it not? Okay. So one can uh, find out the steady states and what you see is that um, actually the stability uh, scenario changes completely in that and but we should do it in the afternoon. Parasitism is very similar to, um, uh, to prey predator thing. So I will just show you because this is a discrete model. Here is a, a system that is being modeled. Here is a sort of insect system which is the host and there is a parasite which goes and lays eggs on the pupae and so the pupae which has on which the parasite has uh, laid eggs that they don't hatch into the adult because they are infected okay so the adult size is basically reduced because of parasitism okay? so this is how the two life cycle interact so the number of adults increase, therefore the number of eggs go down and that is how it goes on. Now since it's an insect model, so there are a whole lot of um, assumptions that you have to do. Every model, I'm not harping on the assumptions because it will take time, but assumptions are very important because based on that you're writing the mathematical function. For example, host parasite interaction is random and is a rare, rare event. How do you put it in, in, in math? The number of encounters is given um, considering that every time n and p interact, then b into n into p is the interaction term like we did for uh, Lotka Volterra. So law of mass action. This can be different if you want to. We also assume the first encounter is significant. You can also assume it needs two encounters, three encounters. Your model will change a little bit. It's a rare event, again, this you can change, but because it's a rare event, your interaction term has to be developed using some kind of Poisson distribution because that is what is used for rare infections, okay? So all these things are important to write down the equations and what is the equation? Let me see, yeah, this is the equation. You can see that, HT plus one, we are back to discrete models, is a function of both H and P the earlier generation, here is the growth term and only those um, insects, those hosts that they grow, the ones which are not parasitized, this is the parasitization term minus B into PT, B is the searching efficiency of P to attack the host and the ones which are already parasitized, that is one minus exponential term, this is the one which lays eggs on the host and that is where the parasites grow, okay? So parasite growth depends on the infected host and the host growth depends on the host which are left unparasitized using a uh, direct uh, 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 density independent growth rate. This is what the model shows. The mo if you, you can do a steady state analysis, you can do a, um, a stability analysis and you can show that this particular model shows nothing but a completely runaway dynamics. So unstable dynamics and the, so the, the solid line, this line is for, from the model. It shows some unstable oscillations and then they keep going up. Whereas somebody did an experiment and in the experiment they showed that they start together, the host and the parasite, but finally they are, both of them go extinct. So obviously there's some problem with the model that it cannot capture whatever even you see in the experiments because the model is showing runaway uh, increase in population size whereas the experiment is showing completely different. So what do you do? You look at the model. The first thing you do of course is you um, kind of change the, uh, the growth uh, density independent growth to density dependent growth. So now your 
uh, expression the way it looks is uh, you modify the Nicholson, that model is called Nicholson Bailey model. So you modify the discrete host parasite population by introducing the logistic growth, okay? R into H into 1 minus H. And this is the parasitization term, okay? This one remains the same, only the host uh, growth term is now density dependent. Intra uh, population uh, interactions have been taken in. And what do you get? I'll, um, so I don't know if you can see from there. Let's consider the case when P is equal to zero, so e to the power zero is one. So there is no parasite, only logistic model. Logistic, uh, discrete logistic growth is there. This is the bifurcation diagram for discrete logistic growth for different values of R. So for different values of R, this model, this host, is supposed to show different kinds of dynamics. Now I introduce P, and you see everything is different. How is it different? So I have introduced P with a certain searching efficiency that it's not that, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a random event, so you have to put in a certain uh, rate of interaction, so that is B. What this one shows is the same R values where the host is supposed to be stable, periodic, and so-called chaotic, okay? Same R values when there was no P, same R values when there is P. And you can see how different these pictures are from here. So what this shows is I'm changing B here, small b, okay? Which means I'm looking at parasites which are least uh, infectious, parasites which are medium infectious, parasites which are highly infectious. Okay, so that's how B, B has increased. What this plot shows you, let me look at this. This plot shows, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, I have, we haven't looked at this, I thought I had, but we started with this. Okay, so 3.2, above 3 are uh, unstable uh, equilibrium. So for very small values of B, which means the infectivity of the parasite is very small, the popula host population actually keeps on doing, going up and down. Okay, only when the infectiousness of the parasite goes beyond a certain value, it becomes more infectious, the parasite, the parasite population starts affecting the host population. You can do a full um, stability analysis to show the dependence of H and P steady states on B. And you will see that for small b, the P goes to zero. You don't even need to plot this. The whole thing can be done mathematically and the, all the insights that you want to know can come out from the stability analysis. So for small b, the, the steady state is p equal to zero, h is the same as this, okay? For only beyond a certain threshold value of b, both h and p both exist, coexist. But immediately the dynamics has changed, whether the the original dynamics of the host is periodic or chaotic, which is shown here. The moment parasite comes into picture, the dynamics become stable, both of them. Now, such a strong influence of parasitism on host dynamics, which completely suppresses all the chaotic oscillations, makes it stable, is very interesting to see. This is why ecological interactions play such a tremendous role on biological population uh, sizes and their distribution. And then as you increase B, it goes through different types of um, dynamics, quasi-periodic, um, chaotic, um, uh, your, what is it called, the, um, uh, the windows of um, periodic orbits, interesting. But this I always like to show because this part, which is so dr dramatic, comes out directly out of your mathematical stability analysis that beyond uh, the threshold value of B, your H and P gives rise to a steady state. Before that, it was unstable because P was zero and the steady state was unstable. You can see these dynamics, but the moment B crosses a threshold, the steady state becomes stable, okay? So it's, it's nothing out of the, out of something very, it's, it's simple. If you know how to do stability analysis, it gives you a very good hand on solving these problems. So there are other in, in, interspecific competition com, uh, where both of them are affecting negatively. 
you can look at uh, some of these models. Lotka Vulture also has competition model where interspecific competition, not intraspecific like contest and scramble. Here, there are two equations. This equation is one population, this equation is another species population. They each of them have a K that is uh, carrying capacity, but now they are competing with each other for maybe for the same resource. So here are the terms A12 and A21. A12 depends on, uh, 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 DN1 DT depends on N2 and DN2 by DT depends on N1. So that's the coupling term here. You can, uh, you should be able to solve it. It's not difficult to do the steady state for it. Um, I mean, like this, there can be any number of models that you can think of and you can develop and you can solve. As long as you know how to go about it, you should be able to solve it. Now, um, basically, given uh, it's interesting to see when will they, co they coexist, that will depend on the relative values of the parameters, whether they'll stabilize or go extinct. There are experimental results. People have grown one organism separately, and this same organism in a mixed population with another, both of them feed on the same substrate, and you can see that it, the, by itself, individually the population would have grown at a much higher level, but due to competition of resources, it goes to a much lower level. Similarly, sometimes it doesn't even grow anymore. So these are things which you can play around with any model. The techniques are similar. You write down the model. If you're writing a new model, look at it, how to develop a model, then find out, write down the expressions. First of all, consider for every expression, you have to uh, set up a functional form for which there are assumptions. You have to note them down because you don't know which assumption is incorrect, uh, which is not letting you match your data with the model. And then you uh, do the steady state analysis, do linear stability analysis, and then do simulation. These are only three things to do. All three are very simple. Everything can be done in XPP, MATLAB, writing programs in Python and C, in Fortran, in anything that you can think of. Some of these models are already there in XPP. Okay, so I will, st uh, what's the time? Can somebody tell me the time? 12.25, oh good. So, very good. So let me, um, so before I do this, um, I hope I'm able to give you some idea about different types of important features that one looks at when one is working in laboratory. It is not possible to do the entire ecology in one and a half hour, but what I've tried is to give you some idea about the two different types of modeling uh, methods, the uh, which represent two different types of organism, uh, organismal growth, the discrete type and the continuous type. For both the cases, to know what a model does. That is, what is the dynamics of the model? That how does it change with time or with generation? The very standard methods, you have to look at, first of all, find out the steady states. Never forget the zero, zero state, because I probably haven't shown you, but there are conditions for at which the zero, zero state also comes up to be important. But anyway, always uh, report that. Find out the conditions at which the steady state is stable or unstable doing linear stability analysis. I'm not even expecting you to do global stability analysis, write a Lyapunov function, which all these mathematics people can do, because that's much more complicated than this. This is much simpler. Once you find out the stability of the steady state, you, you can only say that the sta steady state is stable or unstable you will not be able to say what kind of instability it is. Is it an instability which lets it run away? Or is it an instability which gives it a limit cycle or chaotic orbit? These are not possible to stay say from steady state analysis, but it gives you the first handle on being able to talk about dynamics of ecological models. Then there are other methods that one uses, including simulation to figure out, and that's all pure computer simulation. There is no mathematics to guide you, which is very sad, 
because I consider mathematics to be a guiding principle for any modeling. So you need to learn mathematics to do it, uh, to have a better handle. You can do without it, but you will work without any, uh, any low star or anybody, uh, anything telling you that this is mathematically correct or this is, uh, um, uh, this is not, um, uh, this is not something where the threshold values or the inequalities and all those things you will find out only when you do mathematical analysis. In simulations, you always have to put in values of parameters, so it, it never is general. Simulations you cannot do without putting in the values of parameters, which means you immediately go from a general model to a specific model. You have to keep on changing parameters to see what it does. If you have a mathematical analysis done on stability, you know the bound on parameters when it's stable, when it's unstable. So that is why some of us who did not do mathematics but uh, did uh, physics and others, we learned this. Nobody taught us nonlinear dynamics. We all learned it ourselves to know how to get some handle on ranges of parameters where the steady state is stable, where ranges of parameters where it's unstable, and then go and do simulations. Simulations also, if you're writing your program, you have a much better handle. If you're using MATLAB and any other software, then you are totally dependent on what they do. You have to know what simulation software you will use. There are some 10 or 5 um, uh, differential equation solvers in MATLAB, you have to know which one to use. Each one will give you different results, depending on the nonlinearity. So it is not, it is one thing to just use it, it's another thing to learn. And anything you learn will be useful if you're working in this field, in any area of mathematical biology. Okay, given that, <clears throat> I want to say in short, um, in half an hour or so, that we have been talking about only <coughs> single population dynamics. And I already showed you that ecological interactions themselves change the single population dynamics totally. Without even, you won't even have any intuition how it's changing. For example, the host parasite I showed you. Okay. Now you consider that you are having single populations, but there are multiple patches of these populations and they are interacting. I have no way to tell you offhand without doing analysis what is going to be, suppose a population was oscillating in one place when it was isolated. Now it is getting some individuals coming from another patch and some individuals going away to another patch. What would be the resulting population? You would think, oh, if more um, individuals are coming, maybe the amplitude of oscillation will increase. If individuals are taking out, maybe the amplitude will go down. Is it true? We don't know. Stability analysis and uh, again, same thing. It becomes a little more complicated. Now let me do it step by step so that uh, you at least follow what is being done. You remember seeing this. This is something where I talked about that all these different discrete models given by different people are very similar. <clears throat> First two are single parameter, next two are two parameters. They show the same bifurcation behavior. Okay? So as I mentioned, that people felt that these are this is a universal, there's a universality class, and therefore they can be used similarly. They are all very similar. They're just variations of the same. Okay. Is that right? Okay two things that we are going to look at. There was one data set, I'm not sure if you can see all of them, but just consider. This is a data set which was given by three very well-known ecologists. The last one was is not a lab ecologist, but he's a very well-known theoretical ecologist. In a journal called Animal, Journal of Animal Ecology, they looked at all these moths, beetles, bugs, and all that, and they, they went to the field and found out the population sizes at multiple time points, multiple generations, and they fit that, the, that time series data with a model which Hassel had proposed. I had it in my earlier slide. And found out the corresponding B and R, these two parameters, B and R, for the time series corresponding to each of these um, insect data. 
This is field. They have done it in field, which means a lot of work that you have to go to the field, collect. You can't collect from the entire place. You collect from a sample. So your sample, your design of experiments have to be very good, et cetera, et cetera. And all that has been done. These are called life table data, which they collect. It's a data by itself. Now, when you plot this, the, so they have a series of values of B and R. And I have the equation here. Uh, where is it? I have the equation here. This is the equation they had fit, Hassel, and they have found out the B and the R value corresponding to the insect data. For, and they, uh, this is the table. You can do a two-parameter plot, which means you can plot B in x-axis, R on y-axis, and you can get a plot like this. Here is, so I have a model, which is here. So for different values of R and B, I can simulate this model. I can find out this x, xt, xt plus one, many values, and see whether they are, it is going to stable value, or periodic value, or chaotic value. I can, chaotic dynamics, I can see that. And I can draw boundaries of R and B, below which if B and R values are there, the, all the orbits are showing stable dynamics. Between these two orbits, it's showing damped oscillation. Here it shows stable limit cycle. And then in these values of B and R, it shows chaos. Okay, so that is from the model. Now they took the data and they put those B and R values onto this two parameter plot. And all the dots are here. Almost all the dots are here. There's one here. There's probably one and one here. There's only one in chaotic. So this was a data set which created a whole lot of problem because immediately people said that chaos is something which is absolutely unrealistic. You don't see it in, in ecology. It's just a matter that people are, uh, want to talk about it and physicists like it, so they only talk about it. The most of the data actually are in the stable region. Damped oscillation is also finally goes to stability. Now this was the field data, closed circles, and there were some open circles which were lab data. Lab data actually were both of these which showed some instability are in the lab data. In lab, when you work, when you do these uh, um, uh, studies in the lab, you're taking it away from the field. So a lot of effects of other organisms are not there. So these uh, lab data is always a little more kind of uh, with less um, uh, effect from other organisms. So what do we do? Is it true? Is that what it is? So what we looked at is, so what we looked at is, now this is field data, which means in field a lot of stuff is happening. In field, there's predation, parasitism, migration, whole sort, lots of things are happening happening. Now I'm fitting field data to a single species isola isolated patch uh, model. Is that really right? That is something that a question that you might ask. This kind of question can easily be looked at theoretically. How do you do it? Here it is. What do you do? You take two patches. Okay. Here's patch number one, patch number two. Each, this is, here's a single population growing, here's a single population growing, discrete population, okay? Now, what you then allow is that every generation, you allow from some individuals to go from patch one to patch two, and you can allow both ways also. This you can done using, you can do using your models. So what do you do? You just take your equations, these are my equations, all these equations, and I, I say that I'm going to make a numerical experiment where I'm allowing every generation, that is t, t plus one, t plus two, at every generation I'm allowing a certain f number, a fixed number to either go away or come in, which means I'm allowing them to either emigrate or immigrate. But only a fixed number I'm doing at this point, and I'm not, I'm just allowing, I'm not even thinking of anything outside that patch, I'm only thinking that some numbers are going out or some numbers are coming in, okay? Which means, in reality, what do you do? You simply write, sorry, 
you simply write an equation. Where is that equation? Oh God, where did it go? Anyway, so yeah, here's the equation. So I take these two equations and I either add a fixed number or take away a fixed number at every generation. I can change L, okay? And I do it for both these models. One is logistic model, the other one is, both are discrete models. Now when you do this, what comes? Let me just go back to this. This is the Ricker model. This is the Ricker model when there is no single population, no migration. Basically, this is its bifurcation diagram. This I have shown you earlier. For up to two, it is stable. Then beyond two, it's uh, periodic. Then it's period doubling bifurcations and chaos. What you can show is very simple simulation. Just all these things can be done even using Excel, by the way. You don't need anything. Um, all you do is at every generation, you take out a certain number from you calculate what is the xt, x0, you start with x0, go to x1, then take out a certain number, then take that to go to x2, take out a certain number, then use that to go to x3, okay? Because whatever is being taken out, the rest is growing. That is what you are doing. Or if you are adding, then add and allow it to grow. What you could, we could see is that for such a simple, so here I'm, this is my R, so my bifurcation parameter. With such small migration, that is immigration, the population actually goes to zero beyond R equal to 2.6 or something like that. So it doesn't even go through all this. So here, uh, beyond R equal to 2.6, it goes through all these dynamics. But here, this, it just goes to zero. Population size goes to zero. Now, I never thought it would happen. But you can get this mathematically, by the way, if you do the um, uh, steady state and it's um, positivity of steady state and all those conditions, you will get this. Worst is that at r equal to 2.6, let's say around here, now what I'm doing is I'm changing this L. So I start with r equal to 2.6, somewhere here, okay? So that's why I have four. This is my, when L is zero, it shows me four, um, period four oscillation. But as I increase L, that is I'm changing now this, with increasing L, it starts showing me chaotic oscillation and then it goes off to zero. But beyond a certain value of L, it again starts surviving. So it's supporting low migration, it's supporting high migration, but it's not supporting intermediate migration. This was completely unexpected from the model. But you will get this if you do a, a steady state analysis and positivity of the steady states and um, continuity and etc. The same thing in a two parameter plot for the Ricker model. You don't see, uh, I'll show you in the next. So two parameter means you change both L and R and you see that there's only this white region where the population survives. Everywhere else it doesn't survive. So for high values of R, let's say R equal to 2.6, it is surviving, then it's going extinct and surviving. This is totally unexpected, and this, that is why this paper actually got published in a slightly uh, journal where more people read. Um, uh, now, what is it? Unfortunately, when you do this for logistic model, you don't see this. So here is the bifurcation diagram with L for logistic model rx into 1 minus x plus minus l, and this is x into e to the power Ricker model plus minus l. You start with l equal to zero, so you're starting at period four. If you allow immigration, then in Ricker model, it goes backwards, so these are called reverse bifurcations. Um, it goes from periodic to stable, and if you use minus l, that is emigration, then it goes into chaos. In the logistic model, on the other hand, with minus L, it reverses to periodic, and with plus L, it goes to Q. Now, why is this important? Why is it that this result is surprising? Because what you're trying to be showing is similar models respond differently to ecological processes, okay? So what was considered as universal behavior of these models, these models being 
part of a single class, universal class, where everything is similar. It's not true. Under perturbation, these things, and these perturbations are fairly strongly related to ecological processes. And these are ecological models. So therefore, these models don't remain to be same in terms of universality. The universality breaks down under perturbation. That is for the interest for physics people. And for, bio, for ecology people, it's important what model you are using because it is showing different results under same ecological in, uh, process such as migration. Now, of the four models that I talked about, three showed this behavior. The logistic model alone stood out. Okay. Now, the reason is because these three models basically has this um, uh, has this map here. You can see that this density dependence, the negative density dependence, which is being shown in these three models, are like it has a tail. Okay? Whereas here, the negative density dependence is quadratic and does not have this kind of exponential tail. Okay? So the nature of the density dependence, what this tells you is the nature of the density dependence is important to be considered when you are using the model because they would show very different behavior under perturbation, under ecological perturbation. Therefore, this is an important result that comes out from analysis of the same type of model, which till now I was behaving as if they are all the same, but under small perturbation, which are very relevant to ecology, which is migration, they've uh, kind of, they uh, break down. So this was the initial part of starting how migration affects. What I'm show you two or three slides uh, now, with to say that if you consider bi-directional migration, and if you consider uh, meta populations of very um, uh, kind of model meta population. Now, what are the model meta population? Here is a patch, here is a patch, here is a patch, here is a patch, here is a patch. Okay. So, you can say that this one is interacting, this one is interacting. So, uh, migration is happening both ways. Each one is a population. You, there are two things. One is the type of Interaction. So this is bi-directional migration. For this particular case, let's say if I consider this as the ith patch, then there is uh, uh, individuals coming in and there's individuals going out. Okay, and they're coming in from i i plus sorry i minus one i plus one. Okay, these are called nearest neighbor. Coupling, nearest neighbor diffusion, nearest neighbor migration, whatever you want to call it. Because these are also one dimensional representation of a meta population where you can um, model it as what is known as couple map lattices, where each of these maps, those discrete equations, so they are also called maps. So each of these have maps and they're coupled through migration or diffusion, and it's in a one-dimensional lattice. What is important to also to do whenever you are looking at space, the most one of the most important thing to remember is along with the dimension, the boundary conditions. Without boundary condition, there is no space. Okay? So you can have boundary condition which is fixed. You know, those who know, they know there are names for these boundary conditions. So what happens is all these populations are interacting among themselves inside. Okay? So these are fixed boundary condition. Even with fixed, it can be reflective, like individuals go out but come back, so they get reflected, or it can be absorbing, that individuals go out and they go, they die, or they, we don't know what. It's unrealistic. We generally consider it. There are, there's ocean here, so nothing can go, so everything is happening here. Okay? In ecology, that is how you the other one is that you have a continuity. So this one is interacting on one side with this, on the other side with this. It's like a ring. Okay? So that's the other uh, geometry you can think of. So the cells are sitting like this. You can do these experiments also. You can put them, put test tubes in a ring-like 
um, uh, ring like structure and you can allow migration with this to this, this to this, this to this, this one to this and this. So it's a ring like. Boundary condition has a huge impact on pattern formation that we all know. If you don't know, you will, the moment you simulate, you will do that. The other one you can do is, this is 1D, you can do the same thing in two dimension. So you can have a lattice, two dimensional lattice. So you can take that, whatever we have done, you can just redo the same thing. Now, instead of L, you will have a certain fraction of, of individuals going out from one patch to another patch. So if the, this is XT, so if this is after growth and everything, if it, this, is, this is XT, let's say here, then I say that epsilon by 2 goes out to the I minus 1 and I plus 1. So epsilon is my migration rate. Half of it goes this way, half of it goes that way. Similarly, from here, half of it comes this way, half of it goes here. And here, half of it goes here of this, uh, the, the uh, grown population like that. So you can write the equations accordingly, uh, the um, population equations accordingly, and you can plot and see how they look. Now, I'm not going to write that because it's straightforward. Um, or we'll write it later. What I will show you, you take this map, this one, okay, and then was it, is it this? Yeah. You take this, put it in a one dimensional lattice like that. So each of those patches have that equation, and along with that, it has that epsilon by two of that population size is going this side. Epsilon is always between zero and one, so fraction of it is going on both sides equal amount, and from both sides, again, fraction of that, whatever has grown, comes in. I will only show you a plot. Just notice, don't bother about everything. I will only show you this. Here is when there is no, when epsilon is zero, when there is no interaction between the separate patches. So there are 100 patches here, and in this case, epsilon is zero here which means they are not interacting with each other, they are growing. And they're growing at R value, which is 3.4, which means chaotic. So you can see lots and lots of dots here, almost filled up the whole thing, okay? So basically each population is growing chaotically in that particular patch, that's all. And they are not talking to each other through migration at all. But what this one shows is, if you, if you run it for a very long time, but you allow some amount of interaction. In this case, it's 0.28. There are many uh, different uh, pictures. I'm just showing you one. Then what happens is, I'll just talk about this 15 a little later. What happens is almost all these patches become regular. They are showing only two values. So from chaotic, it has become regular, periodic. But there is a small group of sites which are continuing to stay uh, chaotic. Okay, now this is interesting because what it tells you is in a metapopulation context, when you allow migration to occur, the dynamics of the entire spatiotemporal system or the dynamics of the entire lattice is not same. Each lattice site is doing different things. That depends on what is the rate of migration, what is the growth rate, what is the, uh, how are they connected. In this case, what you get is, uh, I have given as 15, which means it's each, in this case, you, I'm dividing it by two because I'm considering migrations happening only to the two neighbors. But I can have migration with this, I can have migration here, I can have to this one, to this one, like that. That's also possible, depends on, you know, with, if you have, uh, uh, a population sitting, let's say, somewhere in Delhi, then there are surrounding so many um, uh, cities with which it has connections. So it has multiple long connections, but all of them next to each other. Each one of them are connected to each other. These are, um, uh, these are becoming, uh, these are being talked about very recently a lot. Uh, like what happens when you have multiple neighbors like this in 1D also. And you can see that the entire lattice has organized 
the spatiotemporal dynamics is organized into from chaotic complete chaos to complete periodicity and with a patch of chaotic dynamics in it. These are called, uh, in today's uh, uh, jargon, these are called chimera states. If you know what a chimera is, chimera is a combination of two different types of uh, structures. Uh, generally, it was told about um, you know, very uh, structures which are uh, very abnormal. So here also, first of all, you have controlled the complete chaotic dynamics. If you just stop epsilon here, they will start becoming chaotic again. So it's just the interaction among the population gives you this kind of a complete suppression of irregular dynamics, but a small region. Now think about an ecology. You are looking at a population, many populations patches in a big country. And you would assume if my neighbor has a oscillatory or a periodic or a chaotic dynamics, I should also because we are interacting. But you can see that this is how the entire spatiotemporal dynamics organizes itself because of space-time uh, connection. Spatial connections, different types of spatial connections, you may not get this if you have only two neighbors and different types of uh, uh, the connectivity strength, that how much of it is being. I'll stop here because we have to come back again. And um, uh, I, there are more, but I think uh, as far as metapopulation concerned, I, if I have time, I'll show you a little in the afternoon, but the rest of it is. This is how it is. OK. So we were talking about metapopulation, that is population of populations, which means that there are different patches on, in which a particular species population grows. And then they are interacting, all the patches are interacting with each other through migration. And I told you about nearest neighbor um, migration um, more than one neighbor migration, etc. And I showed you one example of a linear patch of or a one dimensional um, lattice model of a meta population where the Ricker model for population growth was assigned to each patch, and each patch was interacting with the nearest neighbor uh, through migration, plus and minus both. And uh, so this was sending a certain amount on both side patches, and the side patches were also similarly sending it in. And I showed you that if you increase the number of neighbors, the, it's possible to get completely different kinds of spatiotemporal patterns, like a com totally chaotic lattice, a lattice where all the population patches are showing chaotic dynamics when they are not interacting with each other, when you allow migration with, uh, among those patches, then a major part of the lattice gets completely regular, like they change their dynamics from chaotic to regular, uh, period two or simple periodic orbit. And parts of the lattice actually gets like a cluster of states which are totally, completely chaotic. And this, is, this happened under uh, uh, the condition when more than one neighbors were connected. So as I told you that in, in, in reality, a particular patch may be connected to multiple neighbors, may not be just its nearest ones, through different types of uh, connectivity, roads, bridges, anything that, that you can think of. So the one I, which I showed you in this earlier slide, that was on these were logistic maps, uh, sorry, um, Ricker maps. The, the first one was unconnected, the second one was connected. And this, this kind of a structure remains there for, this is for 50,000, uh, beyond 50,000 uh, uh, times um, generation simulation, and this remains like that. The rest of the figures are just quantification of those using coefficient of variation, sparsity, etc. So that one, because it's more than one neighbors, there are this, these features have been observed earlier also, but now they are getting some names like chimera and things like that. So I don't see any, nothing starts here. So what I will show you now is 
the equivalent metapopulation of host parasite system. In the sense, I showed you what kind of dynamics the host parasite interacting species model, where you're considering the ecological interaction of parasitism, how, what kind of dynamics they show. This is the equation we have been working on. Um, the host, all these things have been discussed earlier. This is something else. All right, so let's see. So this is the host population. You can see it's discrete generation. So the host grows according to the logistic, discrete logistic equation. So mu into h into 1 minus h. Mu is something like growth rate, which I've talked about. And then this is the parasitism effect of parasitism. Yeah, I was looking for it. Thank you. Uh, can you do something to that? This is the parasitism effect of parasitism, which has been modeled earlier using a Poisson distribution, rare event, etc. Okay. So when p is equal to zero, the um, the host grows with a density dependent logistic model. When p is non-zero, there is a minimum value threshold of beta, which is nothing but the searching efficiency of p to attack the host. Beyond a certain threshold value of beta, the effect of p comes up. So even if the host starts with complete chaotic orbit, after a certain threshold value of b or beta, the dynamics of h and p both are shown here. So H immediately becomes stable, and a P just starts. It was zero earlier, and it starts with. This analysis can easily be done if you do a steady state analysis of this particular equation, set of equations. You will see there is this existence of two steady states. First, it was uh, uh, the, uh, the, the attracting steady state. The first one was H, a finite number, P equal to zero. These are called actual steady states. And then beyond a certain value, there's all these dependence of beta can be calculated mathematically. Beyond a certain value of b or beta, one can see that the h and p, that is the interior steady state where both h and p are positive, that steady state becomes attractive, etc. So a lot of it can be done simply by doing a mathematical analysis of the steady states. What is not noticeable here is that how strong effect the ecological interaction of parasitism has on the host. So from chaotic orbit, it straight goes on to a stable fixed point behavior. Now let's say we have a, 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 a meta population where each of the patches have this particular population, okay? A host parasite population. What is going to happen? So that is all I'm going to show. Completely simulation, so there's nothing much to uh, show here. Let's see, what do we do? This is what uh, happened when you are, when I initially showed you about that plus and minus L kind of a thing, okay? So you're not considering other patches, all you're considering is here is my patch which has HP population and a fixed amount of H is going in or going out or a fixed amount of P is going in and going out. In such a situation you had, so you have to look for uh, zero, so at, in zero both H and P are chaotic and as you increase, this is when migration is allowed only in host, migration is allowed only in parasite and both of them have migration, okay? So these are fixed constant migration and you can see that as you increase immigration, that is positive migration on the host, then a chaotic HP um, system with chaotic dynamics slowly stabilizes both of them. When you allow migration in parasite, when you start from a steady, stable fixed point, it shows, these are called bubbles, you show it, it remains stable, then it shows some sort of a chaotic, this is not exactly chaotic, this is uh, quasi periodic, but doesn't matter. Uh, uh, it shows these orbits, and then again at higher values of L, it stabilizes. 
And when both of them are migrating, you have a, some kind of a mix of those. This is when there are fixed amount of migration going on. What happens when there is, they are in the lattice and both ways migration is happening? Okay, so in, uh, uh, so because it has a uh, exponential term, it's not easy to do uh, a steady state analysis. It's not uh, easy to get a fixed, uh, sorry, a closed solution for H and B. Uh, there are simple ways of doing it, graphical ways of doing it. So I just indicate you, these are the kind of things you should learn to do. So if you have these equations, and I have these exponential terms, so I can't really solve them fully. So what I do is I assume that at steady state, H and P don't change, so it's H star and P star. So I equate the both sides, and then I find out this, this is a very, uh -huh. so then I equate both, both these equations with the, uh, uh, the similar terms, and then I plot this function in this term, so I change H and I find out the shape of this function, I plot this function, and then I see wherever these two functions meet, that is the point at which this is, this is equal, and find out a steady state for different values of L. As you can see, because it is not a pure mathematical analysis, it is still dependent on, to find this steady state, I will still have to give values of parameters, but at least it's better than not knowing anything. So you have some way of figuring out how to find out the steady state um, with these L1, L2s, etc. This is something you have to learn to do yourself. But this was just a digression. What I'm trying to say is uh, if I have a HP system in a lattice like this. Okay, so I have a two-dimensional lattice, like what I drew there. Now it's something like a these are my population patches. You can have as many, as many as you want. Okay, so here now you can see that last time what I did was I said I, I plus one, I minus one. So let me focus on this particular population path. All of them have HP in it, okay? So let me focus on this. This has the HP mod, uh, population growing in it. It's not interacting with anybody else, okay? So right now each one of them have the HP in it and we know the bifurcation diagram. We know how the, what is going to be the dynamics at each path. Now I consider a metapopulation scenario where they, these patches are interacting with the four nearest neighbors. These nearest neighbors can be done in several ways. The simple um, two-dimension lattice is to connect these four. There are people who also connect these. So, and then if you want Next to nearest neighbor, then you also connect these. Okay. So like that you can increase the level of connections, but let's consider something which is the first nearest set of nearest neighbors. That's what has been drawn there. You can see that the middle site, all the patches have, I keep calling them site and patch, I mean, in similar way. So this particular patch has this equation. So what is the equation? The equation is now, now one thing that most people make a mistake on when they work with discrete, um, or uh, discreetly growing organisms and if they're not from uh, biology, they make a mistake say, thinking that migration and growth can happen together. This can only happen in a continuous system when migration and growth can happen together. But in a discreetly growing um, uh, species, they will have to first reproduce and then migrate, or migrate and then reproduce. These are two different separate levels at which things happen. So what I've written here is, there is a population at a particular site, let's say, which is H plus, let's say H plus and P plus at generation T. From this, this, is, uh, this has come from 
after the population has grown in these in the all these sites certain fraction is going out so d1 n is the number of neighbors this in one dimensional it's two neighbors in two dimension one the simplest is four neighbors so it, it is going onto my onto the four neighbors of these this particular patch so a a, a portion a portion which is a fixed uh, you can call it diffusion you can call it migration rate is being divided into four parts and they are being sent into these four patches and of the 1 minus d that is left that is the uh, one which is which is which will be giving rise to uh, this this particular population size so this population size depends on how much is going out and how much is coming from the different sites okay so the population size at a particular patch depends on how much it is sent out through emigration and how much of, uh, how many how much of the neighboring sites or neighboring patches have sent into that patch now once that is these are dispersal or migration rates nearest neighbors are four once i get this this is the one which is now reproducing that is growing so i add the growth term you have a full paper which is what is the difference when you do it on the same generation and what is how different it is when you do it now post so this is intergeneration dispersal to four nearest neighbor then post dispersal whatever the number of individuals remain in this patch they are the ones which are reprodu reproducing okay so now you see that this age is going through the um, uh, the logistic growth function moderated by parasitism and the parasite is growing according to whatever is parasitized and multiplied by those hosts which are parasitized they are giving rise to the number of new parasites so it is a two step process so when you do the simulation also you do it in two steps these are very simple simulations because these are discrete uh, systems no integration nothing you just add uh, you add subtract and then you allow this function to work on it start with this is my when all this is zero d1 is zero d2 is zero this is my uh, there's no ac or fan or something like that no? so this is the bifurcation diagram that a value less than threshold b the host keeps doing its own dynamics that is chaotic dynamics because i have taken r equal to 4 which is fully chaotic and below threshold of b the parasite is zero but the moment the threshold is crossed both the host becomes the chaos is suppressed and becomes stable and the parasite is also starts showing coming up and showing stable dynamics again as i said this you can find out from stability analysis and steady state uh, find out the steady state at this point the h0 steady state is um, unstable and at this point this hp steady state the interior steady state is stable and then this goes through bifurcation uh, which first leads to some kind of um, uh, quasi periodic dynamics and then periodic windows period reversal periodic windows and then chaotic dynamics this is what we start with what happens when it goes through this this is when there is no migration what happens when we, it goes through this so obviously what we do is we take the, the, we put this equation into these four into each of these sites with four neighbors the boundary as i told you is very important in this particular case the boundary is closed okay so there's nothing coming in nothing go out, going out so that is the kind of boundary that we have taken and then we wanted to see what is the role of r that is mu what is the role of um, d1 d2 what is the role of how large the lattice is which is the lattice size what is the role of epsilon which is which is d1 and d2 whatever it etc all these parameters okay so here is a plot you do it many times now why do you do it many times and how do you do it many times because what is changing here you want to simulate this two dimensional lattice with different hp equations sitting on each of these lattice size so you have to start with some h and p 
Now you don't want a result which is very specifically true only for that initial condition. So you have to do these things 100, 200 times, as many times as you can, with changed initial values. So you use random number generators to uh, give initial values to these randomly distribute the initial values. And what we see is if you do 100 times, 93% of the time, 93 times, you out of 100, you get a lattice after a long simulation, which all the sites are doing, having the same state. That is, all the sites are completely synchronized. So if you, the, what this picture shows you is 50 by 50 lattice, and the color shows you the value of H in this case. You can plot P also, but the value of H, and you can see the color is the same, so which means they, all the sites have the same H value. Okay, so that is something which we call, uh, which we know is when all the sites, even though they started the different initial values, so each one of them was doing completely quasi-periodic dynamics, each one of them was showing very different kind of dynamics, now they are all synchronized to the same value. But 7% cases showed this kind of pattern. So to synchronize most of the time, but in some uh, cases, it showed some kind of spiral-like pattern. Now, when this is the space picture, if you want to see this uh, time and space together, because this is just one time point at, in, in the whole space. In the, in the entire lattice, it looks like there's a spiral kind of a, but what is it in time? What, what will be the picture in the next step? The next step, that is given here. So this is a space-time plot, which shows you that each, these are the lattice sites, this is time, color is the value of H, we are plotting H here. And you can see whatever be the color, all the lattice sites have the same color, which means they are all synchronized across the lattice, but they are not temporarily completely the same. So for some time point, it is one, value, another time point, all of them have another value, for some other time point, another value, and like that, but it's regular. This is actually quasi-periodic. So the dynamics remains quasi-periodic, but it synchronizes across the entire lattice. So that is what you see when you connect them together. By uh, left to themselves, they were doing something like a quasi-periodic behavior. That's what I showed you in the earlier slide. They were here, okay, and now when they are Different size, different lattice, uh, uh, different patches are connected to each other, and they show this kind of. You can do different variations. You can change R. You can change um, the lattice size. It could be that because it's a small lattice, it's doing like this. If it's larger, what do you do? So these are called system size dependent. You can change your uh, beta. You can change um, d1, d2, all sorts of things. This is for a specific set of values. Now, in reality, you will never get, in, in nature, you will never get a metapopulation. Already it's a very structured one, but you will never get a metapopulation where each batch has exactly the same parameter values. There will be variations. Now, how, what do you do? What happens if the, the values that I've taken here, mu equal to 4, beta equal to 3.5, etc., are not exactly the same? They are different here. If they're different there, then their dynamics also will be different because they de it depends on that. How do you, first of all, how do you model that? So here is a picture which will give you how do we model that. So there are two kinds of variations that we introduce. So I talked, I mentioned heterogeneity earlier when I started. So we call these heterogeneities. What is the heterogeneity? There, are, there is one kind of heterogeneity you can have that there are some lattice sites which have, where it's vacant, like some regions where nothing can grow, nothing can move, okay? So that's called vacancy or de defective sites or some of these, so randomly you can introduce 10% vacancy if it's a 50 by 50 lattice, so 2,500 uh, patches, of which 10% are vacant, randomly you can make that, just a computational. Just select randomly those and just say that these lattices, nothing can grow, nothing can move. The other thing you can do is, you can choose like this and say these are the population, they are not vacant, 
But these populations have different values of R, different values of D1, D2, different values of um, uh, beta. So there are different species of the same parasite. These are called strains. So it's the same parasite with different infectivity. Or some variation in infectivity uh, is, is in this meta population. Not exact same parameter values for all the parasites. Okay? You can do that. And you can redo this earlier slide work that one has done. You can simulate the whole thing for 100 times or 200 times and whatever it is. And see whether the result that we got last time, that is 93 out of 100 times, it was completely spatially synchronized. Only seven times it, was, it showed some kind of spiral pattern, whether that stays or not. So here's the result. Let's look at this graph. So it says percentage of destroyed sites in a 50 by 50 lattice. So when none, is, none are destroyed, there are about, um, and what is plotted in the y-axis is number of synchronized cases, which means out of 93 out of 100 were synchronized. In this case, we are doing it out of 200, so you can see, okay, 190, how, how much will it be, 3, 14, 186 times they were completely synchronized. But as you in introduce these kinds of vacancies, these are these black dots are the ones where nothing can grow, nothing can move. As you introduce these vacancies, you see the synchronization goes down, which means the lattice is unable to show the synchrony that it was showing earlier, because now there are what these are, this is not at all uncommon in physics. These are called defects introduced in a lattice. But in our case, what we are, the way we are modeling it, these are each site has a, a population growing, and some of the sites, the populations can't grow. So how is the heterogeneity introduced into the model? The heterogeneity is introduced in terms of neighbors. The site which is next to a destroyed site has only three neighbors, because nothing can go there. Okay, so there's heterogeneity in connectivity in neighbors, and that's what is introducing complete asynchrony. So these are the kind of things which you see only in spa spatiotemporal uh, analysis, which you don't see easily in single population studies. So in this case, as the number of percentage of sites were uh, made vacant, that is destroyed, the amount of number of synchronized cases went down. And by 5% sites out of 2,500 sites, by the time 5% sites were made vacant, there was absolutely no synchrony, spatial synchrony in the uh, meta population. So you can see that how small heterogeneity completely changes the spatiotemporal behavior of meta population, in the meta population scenario. But th this picture is the second case that I said that I change beta. So I said betas are not the same in all, all the sites. What I did was some of these chosen sites, randomly chosen sites, I gave a different value of beta. And then I simulated, did the same thing. And there also you see in a site, this is a much hard, hard defect. This is not a hard defect, but you can see that here also there is no synchrony at all. We didn't find any synchronous state out of 200 uh, different cases, even if you do more, there are always postdocs and research students to do more, and they do many more, and very, very, very rarely you get one case where out of, that too in small lattices, in large lattices you never get, okay? So this is one example I wanted to give where you can see that in ecology, heterogeneity is very important because that is what reality is, and even small heterogeneity gives you so much different spatiotemporal uh, behavior. So in this work, uh, essentially what we said is, why is, why is it so? What is the so-called evolutionary advantage of having small heterogeneity? Because that is real. Having exact equal is not real. So what we mentioned is that what, uh, our, what we think is, uh, is the evolutionary argument is that when you have spatiotemporal synchrony or spatial synchrony and temporal variability, then what happens is all the sites are, the population size is going up, coming down, going up, coming down. All of them are doing it together. 
Now, when they're doing it together at a time when all the populations have gone down, very low value, and all of them are low, any ecological disturbance, whether it's a flood, a, a, a storm, or a small disease entering, any kind of disturbance will wipe out all the populations. Whereas in a case like this, where there is heterogeneity and there is spatiotemporal dis differences among sites, some are high, some are low, in such situations, even if some populations are wiped out because they are very low, some which are high would remain, and they are the ones which allow the population to survive. So these are kind of arguments which are given. These are arguments which are given even against, always has been given against chaos being realistic, that chaos makes it so unpredictable, goes up and down. Uh, so that is a problem, it can't be real. I mean, evolution won't select that kind of dynamics. It will, those populations will always go to zero. But here is similarly what we say is that spatiotemporal synchrony is not evolutionary advantages, whereas heterogeneity, which is a straightforward consequence of having small variations in, in biological parameters, for example, infectivity, infectivity, growth rate, these are never the, never absolutely same. They have the advantage of having the uh, uh, spatiotemporally uh, heterogeneous pattern, and that actually makes situations much more advantageous against any problem. The last one I want to show is uh, this. So you know that today's world, Populations don't only interact with their neighbors, they also interact with very far off. This, is, this becomes very important in, in uh, epidemiology because today one disease comes up here, within no time it has reached the other part of the globe. And how did it reach? Because somebody carrying the disease has taken a flight and gone there. So these are very common examples of SARS, how SARS, there's a nice story about how SARS moved from a part of China to Hong Kong, and from Hong Kong it went everywhere. There were six flights that were identified, which went to six parts of the world, and the disease over just six flights went from one country to all the countries of the world. Now, these kinds of connectivity are called long-distance connectivity. Okay? They are not short, nearest neighbor, but it goes from one point from here all the way there. Okay, so now what is this picture? This is a picture which was painted by me. So what you have is a 50 by 50 lattice, okay? Of which 50% of the sites are, nothing can grow there, nothing can uh, uh, live there, nothing can move there. So they are vacant, basically. Neighbors are only four, depending on if the site, if this particular site is next to all these vacant sites, then the neighbor is only one. For example, this particular site will have only one neighbor. All three neighbors are vacant, okay? And a no flux boundary. So the, what the colors show you is the size of a patch which has multiple patches in it. So for example, this one, this green one, has multiple of the lattice sites, but all these are vacant. So it has become an isolated small metapopulation. This whole thing you can call a metapopulation, but now what has happened is they have divided themselves into smaller and smaller groups because of this vacancy around it. Now this one can't talk to this one because there's no connectivity. This group can't talk to this group, there's no connectivity. This small group can't even talk to that because there's vacancy here. Now in such a scenario, so these you can talk about countries which have boundaries completely impermeable boundaries where no visas, nothing works, nobody is allowed to go from one to the other, okay? So like that, these are all different countries. Now there's a flight from here, this country to that country, okay? And that, that's the only way this one can move. They can't move through the border, but they can move through a long distance connection. Bridges, uh, highways which connect from one point to the other point without connecting the midways, these are all long distance connections. So this is how, this is one way of modeling these long distance connections and you can have very many different types of situations you can have. This is when no connections are there. There's when about 10 connections, there are 20 connections, there are 50 connections. You can see more the connections, more the different populations are getting connected. So they are becoming more and more connected site. Um, 
if any of you have ever worked on percolation, then you would know that this is, these are very common things that are talked about there, and we also are interested in these kinds of things. That it's very important when you're talking about pathogen movement. Like if you release a pathogen here, is it going to go there? Who will decide? Connectivity, of course. So you want to model that. And if you know the connectivity pattern, then you can model it and check how long will it take, what is the shortest path, or how does it go. Are there long connections, or if there are no long connection, if it's going to go through neighbors, how much time it's going to take. All those things can be calculated from here. More long distance connectivity, more connected the thing is. So if you start here, you can calculate how much time it will take or how many steps it will take to go all the way here or some kind of, is there a number of long distance connections which allow a particular pathogen to go from this point to this point? Below that number of long distance connections, the pathogen can never move. So it's something equivalent to what is known as percolation threshold in, in, in this context. So some of those theory also can be used here which is very interesting. All you do, all I'll show you now, I'm just showing you this because you have to think when you're modeling ecological systems, epidemiological system, you can, you have to think these kinds of scenarios. So th this is a, a simple picture of the lattice. Here is a situation where there are no long distance connections, okay? And what we have done is we have uh, all the sites all the non-vacant sites have host to start with, initial values of host, but only 10, we just randomly distributed 10 parasites. And those 10 fell somewhere here. And the ones with, where the parasites fell, that is where the host path, uh, parasite system came up, and I'm plotting the parasites here, okay? And you can see that the one parasite fell here, so this is one small metapopulation, there's one here, one here, and things like that, okay? This is when there is no long distance connection. I start introducing long distance connections, 10, 20, 50. And what it's doing is, if this patch had a connection somewhere there, after the parasite has fallen here and moved around to that particular site from where the long distance connection goes, there it immediately moves there. And that's how you can see how the number of patches are growing up. These number of patches are growing because parasites are moving using the long distance connection to other patches. And after a while, when the number of long distance connections larger, becomes larger and larger, almost the entire site, the entire lattice gets filled with um, host and parasites, okay? So these are interesting kind of things which you, uh, I mean, I wanted to end here because tomorrow we are going to do epidemiology, but this is how ecology and epidemiology are connected because all you are doing is using the same Methodology, same concept, same everything, but now you're only talking about host and pathogens. Okay. So this is one way of looking at uh, uh, disease spread in a population, disease spread in space. So that's, that's one of the things I wanted to show you.